The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. I am Erin Ledbetter with Carousel, and we are here today to talk about solutions for activating your target audience with influencer marketing. So um, today's conversation is going to take us beyond just engaging influencers to create content on behalf of your brand, but then how can we leverage the activity that's already happening in these campaigns to increase that engagement through activations that maybe the brand is running concurrently currently or in partnership with our influencers. So um, before we dive into the real content of today, just want to get started with a couple housekeeping things. Um, first and foremost, if you have questions, um, please feel free to drop them into the questions box in your GoToWebinar module there. We will save plenty of time for questions at the end. We are also going to be sending a recording of this webinar out to everybody um, after today's presentation, so you will get that in your email. Email. And of course, feel free to, um, after you review it, if you want to review it again, you're welcome to send us back questions um, later as well. Of course, you can tweet at us throughout. It's another way to get our attention, um, although Courtney and I will be talking and not looking at Twitter, but we do have people that can capture any questions and respond um, during the webinar, or we can actually respond to you after. If you send anything our way, use hashtag influencer webinar. So who's talking today? Like I said, I am Erin Ledbetter. I am Senior Vice President here at Carousel. My role is really about um, product development and developing strategies for our brands. And I am joined today by Courtney Diudo. Hello, Courtney. Hi. Courtney is um, one of our production managers here at Carousel. She's um, one of the folks who's on the front lines working with our brands, working with our influencers, um, working with our media team and analytics team to run the campaigns that we do. So Courtney's going to have some great insight, and I'm excited that she's here to share that with you guys today. So why are you here? You're likely here because you're investing in influencer marketing. Um, we see that influencer marketing budgets continue to rise. 2018 is the biggest spending year yet, with 39% of marketers saying that they plan to increase influencer marketing yet again, and that's after an increase in 2017. And 67% of marketers are saying they believe influencer marketing helps them reach more of their target audience. It's a great way, uh, based on the context and interests of your audience, to really get in front of them in a way that we know from the consumer um, tells us that you know it's really impactful and in increasing or, or affecting their purchase decisions. So today's um, conversation is not just about leveraging influencers, but how we get more out of these campaigns with our influencers. How can we um, activate the audiences while these campaigns are happening? So just to set the context for today, we tend here at Carousel to break um, influencer campaigns into four kind of separate segments. So of course you have your influencer partners and content creation. Um, once that content's created, they're publishing it to their channels. Um, we layer on a media layer um, where it lets us make sure that we're getting the top performing content based on the scoring that we do with our algorithm. Get that content in front of your audience through paid media. Um, and then of course we layer in these engagement activations and engagement activations are what today is all about. So the reason we do them, it helps us get in front of um, these followers that our influencers are engaging with and really up the engagement by getting them to take more action around the content and the campaign theme beyond just liking or sharing a piece of content. There's six categories of engagement activations that we'll talk about today. And without further ado, Courtney, why don't you get us started on the first? Yes, so first are uh, sweepstakes and contests, and we'll see coming up how they are different. Um, sweepstakes are a game of chance, contests are not, and I'll go into that a little deeper here later. Um, so sweepstakes, again, a game of chance. So after the sweepstakes, um, after people have entered to win, whatever those stipulations are, and they can all be different depending on the goals of the campaign, the products, etc. cetera. Um, after that's completed, um, it's winners are selected at random um, and a drawing takes place for uh, where participants have no control over the outcome. Um, pros to this, there are incentives, um, lots of activity, and you can date, you can capture data. Um, they're very simple to manage and easy to rinse and repeat. Um, and then, of course, it's very simple for this um, to live on the influencer channels. Cons, um, you might 
uh, get a lot of sweepers. That's not always a bad thing, depending on the brand and the goal of your campaign, but something definitely to note. Um, and also there's the $500 to $5,000 rule that you have to keep in mind. Anything um, under 500 per person per prize, um, if it's not under that, you have to issue tax documents. And then for the $5,000 rule, if the total prize package for all the winners is $5,000 or more, you have to bond and register the sweepstakes in some states. So definitely keep those pros and cons in mind. Again, with contests, these are not games of chance. They are actually um, selected. Winners are selected um, by judges or based on a certain criteria that's listed up front um, and skill is actually required from the entrance to participate. So the pros to this, you get better quality entries and you can identify advocate stories um, based on who actually uses the product or who wants to use the product. <clears throat> the cons to this, um, there's more work to manage it up front, so you have to make sure that, that you set a criteria, you do monitor the entries, and that you do have um, people in place to judge the winners. Um, often, you need some kind of tech to aggregate and display and moderate the entries, and it requires more customization and legal involvement. So again, things to keep in mind. Yeah, so I, I think contests, you know, tend to be where the brands navigate towards, because you do get better quality, but... It's definitely a lot more work and something to keep in mind. Typically, these can't just live on an influencer channel because you need that tech behind it. Of course, um, we typically see UGC activations as one way that contests are done, although you don't necessarily have to pair an incentive via a contest or sweepstakes with a UGC activation. And the way these work is you have your influencers. They're almost like participants. Of course, they can't win because they're participants um, in your campaign as a whole and they're partnering with the brand. But it's a great way to leverage influencer content to really see these UGC activations, inspire and exemplify for the audience what you want them to create. And you really can get a lot of this content here that brings the campaign um, theme to life. And what we love about UGC content when you can get it is that, you know, consumers respond very well. They say it's three times more authentic than brand created content. Uh, so it can be a really powerful way to expand in an earned way what you're already paying influencers to create for you. Of course, the pros of that, it's a cost effective way to generate content, although it, it is worth keeping in mind that depending on how you set this up, if it's not a sweepstakes or contest where participants are opting in to terms and conditions that you will need to secure the rights to get that content. Um, every legal team is a little bit different in the way that they will accept rights. Some legal teams say, hey, if they tagged our brand, they wanted us to see it, they wanted us to use it, it's implied consent, it's okay. Um, other legal teams on the, on the conservative side will say you need to reach out and get a signed waiver um, that says that you can use this content. And then, of course, there's legal teams that are everywhere in the middle of that. So it's really, you should really work with your legal team um, to make sure that you can use the content when you set up one of these earned UGC activations. Of course, incentives do drive participation. And um, just like Courtney said with um, contests, it is a great way to uncover these advocates and stories of people you didn't even know existed out there. The downsides are kind of watch outs for these campaigns. Um, you, you do have to keep in mind that not every audience is a creator audience. And so, uh, you know, you're not necessarily going to get content coming back that is uh, the same type that your brand would create when you, you have a designer and a professional photographer and all that sticking right to your brand guidelines. And so you got to keep that in mind when it comes to UGC activations. And then you may need a tool depending on um, your legal team's requirements and, and, and just ease of use for um, you or your agency, a, a tool have, having a tool in place where you can monitor the content that's coming in because it is happening across all these different channels um, and giving you the opportunity to request permissions and, and capture those um, accepting of permissions within a tool is really helpful. Of course, one way to make sure that you're getting quality in these UGC activations is to not run them as a broad activation, but actually give or partner with a creator community. The one you're seeing on the right here is um, the JJ community, their photographer community on Instagram, um, run by Josh Johnson. He kind of started it, but there's this whole community of photographers that take on these daily challenges. They're not the only one. There's a lot out there. Um, but what's important about this is, again, you know, this this consumer-generated content, we've seen that it has an effect on 
um, shopping behavior and on, on purchase behavior for consumers. So um, if you get the quality right, you know, it, it's a great, powerful piece of content. So you're going to get better quality UGC because you're going after people who are already naturally creators. You're also likely to get more participation because these people, it, creation's easy for them. Um, so we tend to see when we partner with these creative com creator communities, a lot more people participating in UGC activations. That said, these creator communities have built their communities like an influencer. There's often this, you know, the pay to play. So there's going to be an added cost. It's not just your influencer seeding the idea of UGC and, um, you know, hoping you get some responses. You're definitely going to have to pay to get access to their this following that they've built. Um, and you have to keep in mind, it's more of a watch out, not necessarily a bad thing. The cre best creators may not be your target audience. And so you got to think about what's the goal of the campaign. So if the goal of the campaign is to get this content or to get these stories that you can leverage later, Partnering with a creative community isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if you're trying to use this campaign as a way to influence consumers to take action and your target audience in particular to take action, partnering with a creator community who isn't made up of your target audience may not be the best way to go. So it's really about thinking what's your objective, what are you trying to get out of this campaign. So another type of activation that may be a good fit for your campaign um, or product is um, our Twitter parties, or also known as Twitter chats. These are short-lived, high-frequency dialogues where we have influencers hosting and they get their audiences involved through conversation, um, usually about an hour long. And um, it's, the participation is often incentivized with low-cost prizes. Um, but it's a really good way to get your brand out there and for people to, to talk about the brand or the initiative or product or whatever it is that we're trying to promote. It's a good way to get people talking on Twitter. Um, pros to this, um, it does generate high volumes of content in a short period of time. Um, there's high touch, high frequency impressions, and you do reach other influencers um, and engage certain audiences. Yeah, I think that's important on Twitter. I just want to call that out. Um, what we tend to see with these Twitter parties in the consumer space, at least, I mean, there, there's two sides of it. There's the B2B side and the B2C side. Um, on the B2B side, you know, t the folks on Twitter who are engaging their, their chats, they're not positioned as parties on the B2B side, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, on, and those chats, you get a lot of really quality conversation among, you know, a small group of people in that industry. On the B2C side, um, what we tend to see are influencers, inf social influencers on the consumer side, influencing other influencers. And a lot of times the folks that we're seeing engage in these chats are other influencers. Um, it, it's definitely a higher mix of influencers than what um, we see just following these folks on other platforms like Instagram or Facebook. So even though the um, number of people participating is going to be fairly small in the hundreds, not thousands or tens of thousands, um, you do have very high frequency, high touch engagement, um, and you're reaching people who have influence on others. So, you know, it's a good opportunity to get in front of those folks. And some watch outs, um, it might invite sweepers and low quality engagements, but again, that might not be a bad thing depending on who you're targeting and what kind of um, program we're running. So for instance, um, a lot of couponers or um, you know savvy savings, um, mom influencers, mom audiences might be a good fit for this kind of um, activation and that's okay if they are kind of in the sweeper category. Also, watch out for inflated viral impression numbers because you want to be careful. They're not also counting impressions of replies from participants, inflating your numbers. Live chats can be a lot of fun. Um, Facebook live chats, for instance, um, allow the, the influencers to really shine and show their authenticity. Um, it's interactive, it's live, it's hosted by the influencers on their Facebook, and it gets people engaged, it gets their audiences talking in real time. Um, some pros about this, they are, it does include high touch interactive content. Um, it gets a natural organic boost in the news feed and um, the video content does live on generating even more engagement once it's already gone live. Some watch outs for these, um, live content cannot be edited or controlled by the brand, even with scripts and you know vetting ahead of time. 
because it is live and we want that natural flow, not everything is going to be monitored exactly. Also, the FaceTime quality is often pretty lengthy because, again, they are being authentic to themselves and what they normally do with their audiences, and they're interacting, so they want to make sure that they're allowing the natural flow of the conversation to continue. Yeah, I mean, these these live chats on with Facebook Live are awesome um, as far as engagement and, you know, the influencers really getting the message across, but these definitely aren't those highly produced, you know, commercial quality video that you're going to take and put on your YouTube channel later. So our third category for today are power hours. Uh, power hours are, um, this is really a way to activate the influencers, but we tend to see they drive a phenomenal level of engagement, be, um, you know, in addition, or above and beyond what a standard campaign does. So the way a power hour works, or the way we define it, is that you're having every influencer in a campaign post during a very short period of time. Um, it could be an hour, or a day, or a week, typically never longer than a week. The one you're seeing um, over here on the left-hand side, that was Revlon Mascara Day. Mascara Day was a single day, but we also had promotion leading up for a week leading up to it. Um, but that happened in just one week versus a more lengthy campaign. And the idea behind this is that you're really creating a sense of everybody is talking about this, whatever it is. So Mascara Day is the biggest thing going on right now. Nobody in the beauty space can miss it. Um, and it really signals cultural relevance for your brand. And as a result of that, engagement tends to follow. And so we see these power hours of, as a way of really getting that audience attention. And unlike some of the other activations that we're talking about today, where it does take something a little bit above and beyond what you're already just doing with your influencers um, to create content, this is a way that you can, um, just, by, just by scheduling when people are going to post, um, you can really get this um, engagement coming out of what we're calling power hours here. Of course, there are some watch outs. Um, I, I don't understand it, but I still see brand campaigns today where it's like every influencer is taking the same tweet or the same Facebook copy and image and they're just throwing it up on their channels. Um, maybe you can get away with that if you're running a campaign for a month and folks are, you know, posting it, you know, once a day, somebody's posting for 30 days. But in these power hours, it becomes very spammy very quickly unless you're working with the influencers to make sure that every single one of them has crafted their own authentic, unique story around the campaign theme. And I think you can see that in this example over here on the left of Revlon Mascara Day. While the content is, is all around this mascara cocktailing and mixing of mascaras, um, you know, you can see that really coming to life. Every influencer has put her unique spin on that concept. And so we can be very successful in that. The other thing um, to consider is that these power hour type campaigns, they actually require a lot more upfront coordination because every, we got to find time where every single influencer can participate the same day, same time, um, same week, what have you. And so um, while for us at least a standard campaign takes about four weeks from go to the launch date um, and we run for you know 30 to 60 days, power hour campaigns, while they may only run for a day or an hour or or a week, um, they typically take more like four to six weeks because we really need that time to, um, you know, get get up and running and make sure everyone's coordinated. So another activation that you can take advantage of um, are brand account takeovers, and this is where the influencers literally take over your social channel, um, where they are acting on your behalf and they're using their kind of. Um, they're taking their audience and they're bringing it to your brand directly. So with this, they're they're posting co-branded content and engaging on behalf of the brand um, during the takeover period, however long that is. Um, and so the pros of this, you do attract influencer followers to the brand accounts, um, and you do increase interest and re-engagement from people who might have liked your brand's channel, but maybe they're not as involved as you would like, but they can bring, these influencers can help bring those audiences over to your page um, for even more interaction. Yeah, I want to pause you right there, Courtney, because I, I think this is a, you know, we saw these brand account takeovers happening. Um, it felt like in droves a few years ago, and then it seemed like they kind of died down, and they're starting to pick back up again. And I think what's really interesting about this is as the algorithms have really gotten down to nearly next to nothing when it comes to organic reach, what we see is that these brand account takeovers, by bringing new people in, or even by having these influencers get to folks who 
they might be engaging on their channels and maybe they're following you, but they're not engaging on your channel. And so you've kind of fallen out of that organic feed with bringing that influencer over. Now there's this connection and they're starting to engage with you again. And that recency of engagement is one of the most important things when it comes to the algorithms um, that we see, especially on Facebook and Instagram. So um, getting that recent engagement happening on your channel is a great way to kind of brighten up and lighten up your channel again and, and get some more engagement there. Exactly. And where this could be a really good idea and really work for your brand, um, there are some risks. You do risk the influencer misrepresenting the brand. Um, this is where vetting and making sure that the influencer fit comes into play and it's very important. And people like us and what I literally do almost every day is where I vet influencers to make sure that they are a good fit and that they will represent the brand. Um, but you do have to also be careful that it, the content that they produce for through your brand channels is not overly controlled um, because the followers can feel that authentic the loss of authenticity when that happens. So even though it would be super easy to try to give them an exact script and tell them exactly what to say, you have to kind of keep that in the back of your head that you do want them to have their authenticity shine through because that's why their followers love them and follow them, and, and you want to make sure that that still um, shines on your brand pages. I think that's a great point. I, I think folks can sniff out very quickly um, if it's not coming from the influencer's voice, and so you got to be very careful that um, as as much as it is very scary <laughs> to let someone take over your channels, and you can put certain things in place to make sure that you know you protected yourself from that. Uh, you know, not letting them really beat them on the channel, you might as well not even do this. So number five is probably, is it, you guys have probably all heard of surprise and delight campaigns uh, before, but you know, there's ways that you can leverage these with influencers um, in two ways. One, you can partner with your influencers to help them identify opportunities to surprise and delight their own followers. Uh, which is one way to go, and it, again, it, it drums up that authentic engagement. But this is also a really great way to get some, um, in the days where everything is pay to play um, with influencers these days, you can really engage micro influencers. When I say micro, I even mean kind of on the on the side of nano to micro influencers. So um, definitely under like 20,000, 25,000 followers, um, anything above that, you know, just they get sent stuff from brands all the time. They've made it very clear that, you know, it, it, I'm not just doing this for product. Um, and you really, you know, I think the way to get the reaction these days, because influencers are so used to getting product, is to do more than just product. So I love this example here of what um, our Ignite Social Media, our sister client, our sister agency's client, Gillette, did. They sent um, not something to the influencer himself. This is actually a Paralympic athlete. Um, didn't send to him, but they sent um, a donation on his behalf to a charity of his choice, which was awesome. Um, and what it did is it really told his followers that, hey, these guys care about me. They care about what you care about, what I care about, um, and they're doing something about it. And and what you see as a result is this really ties right into the four pe reasons people share uh, that they've either had an amazing product experience, which wouldn't be the case here, or in in this case, it's the message is just that good. It's worth sharing. Um, the benefits of this, it's often very low cost and you do get earned media out of it. Um, and you build that brand equity where people really see you supporting the influencer um, and the influencer's followers and kind of the community that they've built. Of course, the watch outs, there is no guarantee they'll share. Um, you know, you and it can get kind of pricey to make sure that you're adding something of value. Uh, so you've you got to really make sure you get this right, but when you do, you can get some great benefits out of it. Okay, so coupons and free samples um, can really benefit your campaign. It does create a sense of urgency that inspires immediate and direct measurable sales activity um, where coupons or codes or free samples are exclusive. Um, to or exclusively promoted to the influencer by the influencers. Um, again, they are measurable sales uh, results that you can um, you can go through and, and get a lot of valuable information through. Um, there are incentives to act immediately, um, which gets people to go out and do it then and not wait and hesitate and do it you know months from now. 
Um, and then, of course, the value conscious consumers are more likely to try and share because there's not that much risk for them. They get either a discount on whatever it is they'd like to try. If it's a new product, these are really great for those. Um, or they get a free sample where they literally have no risk at all and they can try it and hopefully go back later and buy it. Um, do watch out that coupon codes will get picked up by coupon hubs. Again, not always a bad thing depending on your goals and what you're trying to do, but definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and then just make sure that when you're doing these, um, you do keep your expectations in check. Um, what's the objective of the program? Are you looking to get um, you know, certain numbers out of this? Are you looking to get sales numbers, certain, you know, free samples out? Whatever it is, make sure you're managing your expectations ahead of doing this um, just to make sure that everything is aligned with your actual goals of the campaign. Awesome. So that was our six ways um, that you can leverage engagement activations to kind of increase and benefit the engagement that's happening in your influencer campaigns. Um, of course, there's many more. These are the six most common that we've seen be most successful. Um, and we have uh, a promise that you would have lots of time back in your day today. So I want to just give us a little bit of time for questions. Again, if you have questions, please drop them into the question box in um, go to webinar. And so um, I'm going to start off with the first one here. Again, you probably have a couple minutes to keep dropping in any additional questions. Um, what best practices would you recommend for influencer takeovers? You want me to start with that one, Courtney? Sure. Okay, cool. <laughs> I know you did the slide, so let me take it. Um, so, you know, I this this is something that, we, like I said, we've seen a lot of brands have success with. And I think it really comes down to allowing the influencer to be themselves on your channels. At the same time, you do want to make sure that um, you have, you know, you've set things in place that are going to let you protect your brand. Um, and so while they may take over for an hour or a few hours or a day or a week, um, kind of like our power hour campaigns, you really got to make sure you have significant prep time in advance. So um, oftentimes that includes um, what we call a welcome packet where we're briefing the influencer and making sure that they really understand what this campaign is all about. Um, I'm sorry, let me back up, vetting the influencer first to make sure that naturally in their own space, in their own voice, in their own content, in the own images that they create, are they a fit for your brand? Now, nobody on this earth is going to be perfect exactly your brand. However, do they complement your brand well? Does their audience follow or is your their audience relevant to your brand? Could they be a good representative for your brand and would the people that you want to buy your brand um, relate to them? Do if they actually so, use your brand? Do they actually use <laughs> your, your brand? Product. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, so that influencer vetting is important. The welcome packet is important to make sure they understand what, what are we trying to do here. Um, typically for campaigns like this, we would get on the phone with the influencer and not just have them read a briefing document, but actually have a conversation with them. Have that conversation to make sure they really understand um, what this campaign is all about, what the expectations are, um, depending on how it's going to go. So um, let's say they're taking over your Facebook account and doing a Facebook Live, you probably want to do a practice run. Um, otherwise, we would we would partner with the influencer to create a script. Now, again, that script is something we partner with them to create. We do not write it for them because we need to make sure it's in their voice. It cannot be in your brand voice. Otherwise, this is not going to be successful. People are going to see right through it. Um, and that we have to let the influencer loosely follow that script. And the reason I say loosely is because we want to give them parameters on what the expectations are and kind of guide them. But at the same time, um, if the conversation goes a different way, we've got to let it go where it's naturally going. Um, of course, you stay in touch with the influencer the entire time. Typically, you know, we stay, we do a war room, stay on conference calls with them or plan to touch base with them throughout the day, make sure we have that plan in place. Um, so if things start straying off of the script, um, we still have the opportunity to, um, you know, course correct and work with them on what the best strategy would be. 
Okay. Um, next question that I'm seeing here, what tools do you recommend for monitoring content for UGC activations actually in particular? Um, you know, I, I think that that really goes down to whether or not you have tools in place already. Um, so, you know, if you have a brand watch or a Sysmos or something like that in place, um, you can, you know, scrape as much public content as is out there um, using a hashtag or a keyword. Now, one of the watch outs is to make sure that you have a unique um, hashtag or unique keyword that you're looking for um, and it can't just be unique to your own usage but before you set it up you want to make sure that the world isn't already using it um, in some other way otherwise um, you're going to have millions of entries, which are going to be impossible for you to sort through, for one. Um, you're going to have stuff that you can't tell, are they actually entering or not, which is important. Um, and uh, depending, on what your, um, depending on what your contract is with these listening tools, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg if, if you get a lot more participation. And so um, it's really important that you have that listening tool set up, um, that you have a way for not just your analytics folks, but whoever is administering this, typically it would be a production manager like Courtney or promotions manager or community manager. You know, somebody who's the one administering the campaign really has to have access so they can get in and, and see what's coming in, um, look for ways to optimize the campaign, but also see if there's any red flags coming up. So any other questions today? I think we're good at this point. So um, questions are all done, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for our webinar where we discuss six um, categories of ways that you can further activate an audience um, in com or complementing one of your influencer programs. So we will be sending this um, after the call. You can look at it for look out for it in your email. We'll send you the recording in the deck. Um, and of course, you feel free as you go through it and revisit it. You can send us questions via email afterwards or on Twitter at Carousel, and we will be happy to answer them for you. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.